While the definition of beauty may evolve, one thing never changes. People always desire to look their best. However, making ourselves appear attractive is fortunately not nearly as dangerous today as it once was. Thanks largely to Eugene Schuler and L'Oreal. The days of using arsenic and belladonna to improve our appearances are long gone. Instead, he placed beauty at the forefront of science and developed the first safe hair dye, beating customer expectations. Early History Schuler was a brilliant chemist and the son of Paris pastry shop owners. He applied to the Institute of Applied Chemistry after finishing his first two years in college, and he succeeded brilliantly finishing first in his class. He found a job as a lab assistant at the prestigious Sorbonne soon after receiving his diploma in 1904. It was a respectable but not particularly lucrative career as a university researcher. Schuler looked like he had an academic career set, given that he began working as a lab assistant, but something happened that would alter his financial situation forever. A national barber shop chain owner sought Schuler's advice about developing a synthetic hair color. As a result of the toxic lead content of dyes, which caused scalp irritations, only a few French women dyed their hair in the early 20th century. Due to Schuler's keen interest, he agreed to serve as the barber's technical advisor until he later rented a laboratory in Paris and began producing his hair dyes. Unfortunately, he couldn't continue working with the barber, so he started independently. Although his first set of attempts failed to live up to the expectations, he persisted, continuing to experiment with different dyes even on his own hair and altering the recipes. After years of experimenting with various dye formulas, he succeeded with a recipe and founded the French company of inoffensive hair dyes in 1909. Because of this brilliant invention, women could finally dye their hairs without worrying about the chemical compounds that they were applying to their scalp. He did fairly well, and when World War I interrupted production, he enlisted and received recognition for his bravery in battle. Then, in 1935, L'Oreal introduced the first mass-market sunscreen. L'Oreal chemists developed Ombre Solaire to help people achieve a healthy tan without sunburn. At the same time, workers began to receive annual paid vacations, and beach tourism grew as people sought to maximize their vacation time. Schuler Work Ethic Schuler was a nervous thinker who worked obsessively. As if running his company wasn't enough, he constantly researched new theories about business, the economy, and politics. In his early years, he experimented with socialist ideology. Following that, he became a Freemason and briefly followed the secrecy of the intellectual humanist movement before leaving three years later. He quickly developed an aversion to Jews, Republicanism, and Freemasonry. Schuler began elaborating on his emerging economic theories in several books, articles, radio interviews, and public lectures in the middle of the 1930s against the backdrop of the Great Depression to win over readers. His main point was the phrase, proportional salary. He claimed that employee salaries should be proportional to their output rather than being paid hourly or daily. He did use this principle to run his businesses at L'Oreal in part, and economists took notice, though the plan was never widely adopted. Effect of Political Policies on L'Oreal the French paramilitary regime, known as the Third Republic, which had taken power following Napoleon III's overthrow in 1871, was in a delicate position at the time. In 1936, the socialist Léon Blum, leftist Front Populaire, won a parliamentary majority in a country riven by strikes, militant syndicalism, unemployment, and political instability. Two examples of their politics include the nationalization of the railroads and the Bank de France and the two-week paid vacation that all employees are entitled to. Time off paid off, at least in terms of business, because people from all socioeconomic backgrounds flocked to the beaches to soak up the rays. Therefore, L'Oreal's new sunscreen, Ombre Solaire, sold extremely well after its release. Although it made Schuler famous and wealthy, he opposed his employees' vacations. Schuler's bottom line benefited from his new policies, but he saw no benefit in them. Similarly, he disliked democracy because it tends to elect incompetent leaders, and the fact that a socialist Jew led the front popular government did nothing to improve his opinion of it. The Effect of World War on L'Oreal In the late 1920s, Eugene Schuller acquired the Valentine Company. L'Oreal referred to it as a new step in creating a global empire. Although Valentine may not be as well known as L'Oreal is today, the company produced varnish and paint. These two products were somewhat comparable to the giant of the cosmetics industry. During World War II, Schuller ensured that these products were produced, because every military vehicle that left the production lines had to be painted. Paint was a big deal, and Valentine was one of the first category businesses that provided paint to the German Navy in 1941. In his capacity as Valentine's then director, Schuller negotiated the three-year agreement. Gerhard Schmelinski, a German businessman, helped form a partnership with the German firm Druckfarben. Meanwhile, Schmelinski wasn't just a regular businessman. 
He was a crucial component of the Nazi economic strategy to seize Jewish citizens' businesses and transfer them, along with their assets, to the Nazis. He praised Schiller wholeheartedly, describing him as an ardent partisan of the French-German accord. Schiller's relationship with the Germans significantly increased his fortune, as revealed by his tax returns between 1940 and 1943, which was 248,791 francs. While his net worth income nearly multiplied by 10, 2,347,957 francs, L'Oreal saw a roughly fourfold increase in sales between 1940 and 1944. Transition of Ownership Liliane was born in Paris, France in 1922, the daughter of Eugene Schuller. Liliane began her career as an apprentice at L'Oreal when she was only 15 years old. She would prepare the final product by combining the ingredients and labeling the bottles. In 1959, Liliane married André Battencourt, the vice chairman of L'Oreal. After World War II, L'Oreal offered Bettencourt and other members of the fascist group, La Cogol, jobs to conceal their fascist past. Eugene Schuller died in 1957, and Liliane inherited the entire L'Oreal company at 35. Liliane was a longtime L'Oreal employee, serving as a director until 1992. Jean Victor, her grandson, is currently in charge. Liliane's leadership skills enabled the family business to grow through strategic mergers and acquisitions. Liliane Bettencourt died in 2017, a month before she would have turned 95 years old. She owned 29.51% of Nestle and 30.55% of L'Oreal and set up a trust to hold her 12.56% stake in L'Oreal. She had previously given this to her daughter Francois, a French director, which also inherited at least half of her estate because she was the only heir under French law. Present day L'Oreal Today, the company produces over 500 brands and thousands of products, including hair color, makeup, body and skincare, and fragrances. Some of these are The Body Shop, the Chinese beauty brand Magic Holdings, the Shiseido brands Cardia and Declore, NYX Cosmetics, Carol's Daughter, It Cosmetics, and Modiface, which are among the most notable acquisitions. Since 2006, Jean-Paul Lagon has served as chairman and CEO of L'Oreal. While the Betancourt family owned 33.31% of the company in 2013, Nestle held 23.29% and institutional investors had 21.8%. The remaining 15.3% is owned by French institutional investors, individual investors, and employees. What do you think about Eugene Schuller? Let us know in the comments, and thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.